Johnny Tremaine, A Story of Boston in Revolt by Esther Forbes. We're on chapter one, part three. He decided to do nothing that would lay him open to such criticism for at least a morning, but he couldn't help it. First, if he had not jumped on Dusty, the furnace would have, got, would have gone out. Then he had to explain to his master how badly Dove had done the spoon. Although he tried to sound humble, he was soon behaving perfectly naturally, standing over Mr. Latham with his notebook in his hand, reading off exactly how those spoons had been ordered. Mr. Lafon was a fine craftsman. His weakness was that he never wrote down what he ordered or even listened very carefully. If a patron ordered a sauce boat, he would get a fine one, perhaps a month after it had been promised. Sometimes it weighed a little more, sometimes a little less than it was supposed to. Sometimes it had, play, it had splayed feet when a gadrum edge had been asked for. Mrs. Latham herself had told Johnny he must always be on hand and write down exactly what the order was. This was necessary. But it did seem cheeky to see the 14-year-old boy standing there telling his master what he was supposed to do. Johnny had started everybody off on, their, on his work. Even Mr. Laf even Mr. Latham decided to go... Wait, Johnny, having started everybody off on his work, even Mr. Latham decided to go to the coal house and see if he should order more coal, more charcoal. It was such things Mr. Latham never thought about until too late. There were two basketfuls of charcoal and at least half another scattered over the floor. That was the other boy's fault. Johnny himself was too val valuable to carry charcoal. He started to yell for Dusty, thought, thought better of it, and went to work arranging the dirty stuff himself. When he was a master craftsman, when he, that is, was a master craftsman, he wasn't going to buy charcoal by the basket. He was going to own his own willows, say, out in Milton. That would save, say, two pence a basket. In a year, he, he began to figure. And he wouldn't, in a year, he began to figure. And he wouldn't just... He wouldn't take just any boy whose father or mother wanted him to be a silversmith. He'd pick and choose. He saw himself sitting at a bench, his own shop, crowded with boys, with mothers, boys with fathers, all begging to be allowed to work for him. He'd not talk to his parents, only to the boys. What church did they go to? King's Chapel? All right. Describe to me at least one piece of silver you see over every Lord's Supper. If they could not answer that, he'd know they hadn't got silver in their blood. But how could he find which boy had nice hands? Johnny! It was Madge's voice that pulled him out of his reverie. He wiped his black hands on his leather breeches and stepped out into the sunlight of the tiny backyard. What is it, my girl? He often thus arrogantly addressed his master's granddaughters, really his own mistresses. <laughs> Ma sent me, Johnny. It's Mr. Hancock himself. He's in the shop ordering something. Stand by and listen to Grandpa. Listen, or Grandpa will get it wrong. Dorcas next flung herself upon him, too excited to be elegant. Johnny, hurry, hurry. It's Mr. Hancock. He's ordering a sugar basin. Can't you go faster? Shake a leg. Isana was jumping about him like a wild thing. Help, help, she shrieked. But it was Scylla who thought to offer her, to offer him her clean apron for a towel as he washed off the charcoal at the yard pump. Oh, but he must hurry. Oh, but he must hurry. And there was Mr. Latham, Mrs. Latham, tapping at him from the kitchen window. Slowly, he approached, he approached the house, the girls chattering about him. Close to the shop, shop door was a tiny African holding a slender gray horse by the bridle. Johnny noted the handcocked arms on the door of the gig. He felt so good he could not help saying to the black child, mind that horse doesn't trample our flowers. Mind that horse doesn't trample our flowers. There were no flowers in the Latham's yard. Oh, no, sir, said little Jeff Jehu, J-E-H-U, 
rolling his eyes. He thought, from the attention this boy was receiving from his escorting ladies, he must be a boy of consequence. Johnny slipped into the shop so quietly that Mr. Hancock did not even, didn't even look up. It was he who owned this great wharf, the war houses, many of the fine ships tied up, tied up along it. He owned sail lofts and shops and also dwelling houses standing at the head of the wharf. He owned the Lafon House, Lafon House. He was the richest man in New England. Such a wealthy patron might lift the Lafons from poverty to affluence. Mr. Hancock was comfortably seated in one of the arm in one armchair, which was kept in the shop for patrons. When I'm master, thought Johnny, there are going to be two armchairs, and I'll sit in one. Unobtrusively, Johnny got his notebook and pencil. Dove and Dusty were paralyzed into complete inaction. Do something, Johnny muttered to them, determined his master's shop should look busy. Dusty could not take his eyes off the green velvet coat, sprigged white waistcoat, silver buttons, and buckles on the great man, but he picked up a soldering iron and nervously dropped it. And to be done next Monday, a week from today, Mr. Hancock was saying, I want it as a birthday present to my venerable Aunt Lydia Hancock. This is the creamer of the set. Only this morning, a clumsy maid melted the sugar basin. I want you to make, make a new one. I want it about so high, about so broad. Johnny glanced at the delicate lace, lace ruffled gesturing hands, guessed the inches and wrote it down. Mr. Latham was looking down at his own gnarled fingers. He nodded and said nothing. He did not even glance at the cream pitcher as Mr. Hop, Mr. Hancock set it down on a workbench. Johnny heard Johnny's hard, delicate hands, so curiously strong and mature for his age, reached quickly to touch the beautiful thing. It was almost as much by touch as by sight. He judged fine silver. It was indeed old-fashioned, more elaborate than the present mode. The garlands on it were rounded out in repose work. Mr. Latham would have to do the reposaying, the reposaying. Johnny hadn't been taught that yet. He looked at the handle. A sugar basin would have to have two such handles, and they would be larger than the one on the creamer. He'd shape it in wax, make a mold, he had cast hundreds of small things since he had gone to work for Mr. Latham, but nothing so intricate and beautiful as the woman with folded wings whose body formed a handle. He thought he had never seen anything quite so enchanting as this picture. It must have been the work of one of the great smiths of 40 or 50 years ago. Although he had not intended to address Mr. Hancock, he had said before he thought Johnny Coney, sir? John Coney, sir? Mr. Hancock turned to him. He had a handsome face, a little worn, as though either by health, either his health was bad, or he did not sleep well. Look at that mark, boy. Johnny turned it over, expecting to see the familiar rabbit of the great Mr. Coney. Instead, there was a pellet and an L, and a pellet. There was a pellet and L and a pellet. Hmm, your master made the creamer 40 years ago. He made the entire set. You made it? You made it? He had never guessed there had been a time when Mr. Latham could do such beautiful work. At last, Mr. Latham raised his protuberant eyes. Protuberant, P-R-O-T-U-B-E-R-A-N-T. I remember when your uncle, Mr. Thomas Hancock, sir, ordered that set. Make it big and make it handsome, he said. Bigger and handsomer than anything in Boston. As big and handsome as my lady is. Make it as rich as I am. 
John Hancock laughed. <laughs> that is just the way my uncle used to talk. He was so sure of his own good breeding. He could laugh affectionately at the rich, quick vulgarities of the, of the uncle who had adopted him and whom, from whom he had inherited his fortune. Uh, that, so John Hancock actually just said, uh, that is just the way my uncle used to talk. The rest of it was uh, narration. Okay, excuse me. He stood up. A tall, slender man who stooped as he stood and walked. The fine clothes seemed a little pathetic. He had a soft voice and low but you have not as yet said whether or not you can make my sugar basin for me and have it done by Monday next. Of course I thought first of you because you made the original, but there are other silversmiths perhaps you would rather not undertake. Mr. Latham, Mr. Lathan was in the study. I've got the time, the materials, and the boys to help. I can get it, I can get at it. But honestly, sir, I don't know. Perhaps I haven't got the skill anymore. I've not done anything so fine for 30 years. Mm. So he changed his tune. First he was eagerly saying, oh yeah, I've got the time, I've got the boys, I can, I've got the skill. And then he changed his tune to, I don't know, hmm, perhaps I haven't got the skill anymore. I've not done anything so fine in 30 years. I'm not what I used to be, and although neither of the two men could see the door leading from the hall into the shop, Johnny could. There was Mrs. Lathan in her morning apron, her face purple with excitement, and all four girls crowded around, crowded, crowded about her listening, gesturing at Johnny. Say yes, all five faces, big and little, mouthed at Johnny. So they had forgotten morning prayers, had they? Wanted him to take wanted wanted him to take charge. We can do it, Mr. Hancock. Bless me, exclaimed the gentleman, not accustomed to apprentices who settled matters while their masters pondered. Yes, sir, and you shall have it delivered at your own house a week from Monday, seven o'clock Monday morning, and it's going to be just exactly right. Mr. Latham looked at Johnny gratefully. Certainly, sir, I am humbly grateful for your august patronage. He was not a proud man. He was rele relieved that Johnny had stepped in and settled matters. Mr. Hancock bowed and turned to go, but none of the boys thought to run ahead and open the door for him. So Mrs. Lathan, apron and all, barged in, her red arms bare to the elbow, her felt slippers flapping at her bare feet or bare heels, and did or overdid the, courtesy, the courtesies for them all. Hardly was the door closed. Then there was a trap on it. Little Jehu came mincing in, a glitter of bright colors. He solemnly laid three pieces of silver on the nearest bench and recited his piece. My master, Mr. John Hancock, Esquire, bids me leave these coins, one for each of the poor work boys, hoping they will drink his health and be diligent at their benches. Then he was gone, hoping they would vote on him, vote for him when they were grown up and have enough property. <laughs> don't ever, don't you ever vote for Mr. Hancock, sir. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, forgive me. Don't you ever vote for Mr. Hancock, sir? asked Johnny. I never do. I don't hold much with these fellows that are always trying to stir up trouble between us and England. Maybe England rule, maybe English rule ain't always perfect, but it's good enough for me. Fellows like Mr. Hancock and Sam Adams calling themselves patrons and talking too much, not reading God's word like their parents did, which tells us to be humble but he's my landlord and I don't say much. <laughs> Johnny was not listening. He sat with the picture in his hand to think the poor, humble old fellow once had been able to make things like that. Well, he was gonna turn the trick again before he died, even if Johnny had to stand over him and make it. 
the end of chapter one, part three.